Welcome everyone Thanks for joining us today. The following seminar is brought to you by iExplore Club. I am honored to be introducing our seminar presenter, Ryan, who will be telling us all about photosynthesis. And so Ryan, it's all you. Thank you, Kathy. Hi, my name is Ryan Kern and I'm currently a 10th grader at Troy High School. Here you can see I really like playing piano and I also like to play water polo. I'm really interested in biology and want to become a doctor when I grow up, which is why I'm teaching this course. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about photosynthesis and it's really important, especially in the plant world because it's really how all the plants make their food. Because some of you may be wondering like, how do plants make their food? They just, because I don't see anything really going into them. They're not eating anything physically. How does it go in? And that's what we're going to be talking about in this seminar today. And really the thing is, it's so important because photosynthesis is how the sun powers all life. Because the sun is going to be giving all this energy that we're going to talk about later to these plants. These plants are then going to be eaten by like a rabbit and then the rabbit will be eaten by like a lion and so on. And it really drives the entire like ecosystem, which has all the animals and really starting just with the plants. So it's very, very important. Here, as usual, we're gonna start off with what is photosynthesis. And I really wanna start off because I wanna make sure we're all on the same page and everyone has a good idea too. So yeah, we'll give people some time to vote here. And today's gonna be actually really interesting because I have two pretty cool videos for both of you, for everyone here. And so I look forward to showing them to you. You guys are really gonna enjoy them. Okay, we'll give everyone just like two more seconds. Okay, great. So everyone, good job. How plants get energy from the sun. That's great. Here is the dictionary definition, right? We have photosynthesis. It's like plants get, use the sunlight and then they make food from carbon dioxide, water. We'll talk about that a little bit about what they actually use and then what they release too. Cause you know how like plants are gonna end up releasing that oxygen into the atmosphere, which we breathe in. And it's really important for them to have the starting materials or the starting like stuff, which would be the carbon dioxide and water for them to actually build the stuff and build like the food that the other animals are gonna eat and then also release the oxygen that we're gonna breathe. So once again, the plants are just so important and really this is the process that keeps plants alive and helps them help us. Okay, and here also another part. So with photosynthesis, they cut it up into two parts. And I'm just wondering if you guys know at all what those two parts are. Yeah, the two parts are pretty detailed. So we're gonna try to stay kind of like abstract. We're not gonna go too much in depth because it might be a little overwhelming, which I don't want. And once again, we just want you guys to get the general idea. That's why we're here. Okay, give everyone just a couple more seconds. Okay, we can end the poll. Okay, this one, I see people are struggling a little bit. So it's actually not carbon, di carbon and dioxide, even though I was saying that's like the product, or sorry, the, that's what you start off with, but it's actually the light reactions and Calvin cycle. These can be thought of like the two phases, right? So they first, the plants first go through this first phase, then they go up to the second one. And obviously it's not gonna be like the first phase is carbon, the second one is dioxide. So yeah, here we see this is the light reactions and the Calvin cycle. And it's very interesting. A lot of times you'll see this in biology, the way that like scientists name stuff, it's really based off of what actually happens. So for light reactions, for example, this one is because the sunlight, which you can think of almost like, you know how you plug in your computer to an outlet to charge or you plug in your phone into an outlet. You can think of it like that. It's this huge, gigantic like ball of just energy, right? And then it sends down these like this just like sunlight rays and then that's what's being used as energy and then it goes into the light reactions and it helps make the final products right and we're going to talk about the final products too later the other one called the calvin cycle 
it's also interesting because the person that uh, the person that actually found out and discovered it was actually named Calvin. So just remember, if you guys are ever in biology and discover something, you can name it after yourself. Here, uh, this is another diagram, and we're going to talk about these here. But those these little like kind of squashed ovals, they're called the stack is called granum, and what they are is they're really where the first half is going to take place and they're inside the chloroplast. Remember, if you remember our like cells video, we talked about that in plant cells. The chloroplasts are where photosynthesis happens. And again, photosynthesis just make, means like making food from light. So that's where it happens. And you can see this entire like green circle, the huge one, that's just the chloroplast. And this is more like the details on the inside. Again, you don't have to worry about all this, like what does this mean? Like you don't need to really worry about that right now. We're focusing on just the general concepts and ideas. Yeah, and so then you can actually break these up even more here. So we have like photosystem, which just means like, uh, we'll, we'll look at it more and then we have a electron transport chain and then it's just a repeat pattern here. And really what's happening, cause we can look at this and be like, oh my, it's so confusing. But really, it's just using energy and taking some like some like um, we can think like molecules, right? Using energy and then changing those molecules. So we have the carbon dioxide and water; those are the starting ones. We put it through, and then we get something new at the end, right? Let's say you want to make a pizza. What you actually put on your pizza before you put it in the oven is not what you're gonna like eat immediately. You're not gonna put a bunch of like cold tomatoes, like cold. Um, cold sauce or just like raw meat you're not going to just eat that right but you're going to put it there and then after you have all this energy from the oven all the heat it's going to cook it so then at the end you have this final product that you can actually eat so this is really like that because you put in something you have some energy change it and then it releases something new here's the equation this just means carbon dioxide h2o hopefully is just water you know and they're talking, they're using this arrow that just means, once again, we're taking these two, using the sunlight, and we're producing something new. Here we have oxygen. And you can always just remember whenever you see this, like this really complex, kind of big looking like equation, you're not really sure. And it's like in the photosynthesis one, just remember it's a sugar. And that's what like rabbits eat, right? Rabbits eat plants. But what are they eating in the plant? They're just eating like the plant because it tastes good? No, because there's actually sugar and then there's nutrients, which is why also for the healthy eating seminar, that's why when you're eating like a lot of those leafy greens and you eat them, that's why they're so nutritious for you because they have a lot of this like just glucose like this. Is the glucose is a specific sugar. Yeah. And so we're going to try not to get too much in depth. Here's the like structure of the chloroplast uh just notice one thing is we already talked about the little stacks here. Almost like, you know, you can think of them as like stacks of like pizzas maybe inside of like an oven or container. But there's, it's really interesting because there's actually two membranes. So it's like you can think of putting it in like a double bag. So let's say you have a bunch of like pizza dough. You put it in one bag and you put it in another bag. And that's basically what a chloroplast is. Okay. So we're going to... Uh, I think we'll just do one question here because we want to, like I was saying, we have the videos that I want to get to, and those are really cool. And I want to make sure we have enough time for that. Uh, we actually haven't gotten any questions so far, but if you do have a question, make sure that you drop it in the chat below and I will read it off to Ryan later. Okay. That's completely fine. Yeah, for sure. And then at the end, if you guys have a question too, you can definitely ask. Okay. So here we're going to actually, um, oh, I need to, I need to reshare to share the audio, I think. Okay, here, this is like a short little video. I thought it was really cool about like what is photosynthesis too. I think I should be able to play it. Hey there, it's a lovely sunny day today. So I came down for a sunbath. Don't look at me like that. Didn't your teachers tell you that sunlight is a good source of vitamin D? Hey, 
Don't forget that we trees and plants make our food from sunlight. Yes, you're right, Mr. Tree. Isn't the process called photosynthesis? Yeah. Come, friends, let's learn about photosynthesis today. Zoom in. Photosynthesis. Doesn't that sound like a big word? Well, don't be bogged down by it. I'll tell you what it means. Photo is a Greek word for light. And synthesis is a Greek word for putting together. Now, it's simple. Photosynthesis is using light to put things together. Plants use this process to make their food with the help of sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide. Did you know that plants breathe just like us? You didn't? Well, now you do. Plants have tiny openings called the stomata present in their leaves, through which they take in carbon dioxide. Yes, they breathe in carbon dioxide and give out oxygen. They also use water and other nutrients to make food which is absorbed by their roots. The leaves contain tiny pigments called the chloroplasts. These pigments take in carbon dioxide, water and sunlight and turn them into sugar and oxygen. The sugar is then used by the plants as their food and the oxygen is given out into the atmosphere. This process as a whole is called photosynthesis. Am I right, Mr. Tree? Yes, you are. Trivia time! Chlorophyll is a green pigment that is found in the chloroplast of the plant. It makes the plant look green. Plants are often known as lungs of the world as they take in carbon dioxide and give out oxygen, which the humans breathe. It's time for some more sun bath. So this is me zooming out. Tune in next time for... Yeah, so I hope you guys really enjoyed that video. I thought it was a really good like summary too, because like I was saying, right, they take in those compounds, which is like the, the carbon dioxide water, then they use the sunlight, and then they make new things from it. Just like we were talking about the oven and making a pizza, just like that. So here, this is the first part. We're going to talk about the light reactions here. Here is the process. If you remember from the cell, the like cell seminar I did, these is the, the membrane. So we have our cell, right? That's like a, a sphere. So you can think of it as like a ball. And then the outside is covered in this sort of layer. It's like a membrane. And so that's what this, these little dots with the lines here are. And over here we have like it looks really complex, but it's really not, right? I have like some really good analogies so to help you guys understand it here. And so this is a photosystem and a photosystem, just electron transport chain, electron transport chain, and then some other stuff here that we're gonna get into. But I trust like really it's not that bad. It's not that hard to understand. So let me help you. Here, we're gonna use this to kind of show how the how the whole process is like really what these workers are doing right so at the photosystems what's happening is they're using that light energy and then you can think of it like almost charging a battery or something they're using it and then they're charging it and then the battery gets like really powerful and then it'll like it'll charge these electrons which i can talk about in like a, a separate video a separate seminar but they charge the electrons up and then as you see here, so then the light energy is charging them, they're going up and then they get like really charged up. So you can think of like a battery maybe, like when it's fully charged, like your phone, maybe 100%, it goes up here, right? And then 
since like you use your phone and maybe you use the flashlight, maybe text that takes more battery or you make a couple of phone calls to your friend, it eventually is going to lose some of that energy and some of that, um, some of that power really. But then as it loses it, it's being used, right? Cause you're using it for something and you can think of that as it's doing work. And we'll get a little bit more into this later, but you just remember you're using your phone for something. It's not just like, you don't just not use it completely and it all of a sudden goes 100% to zero. No, you use it and then it goes like 100% and eventually goes down to 0%, right? So that's what's happening here is we charge the battery up and then it goes down slowly. And over here, what happens is we're using another light energy. So it's like we're charging it again and then we have it go up again. So that's really all that's happening. It's like the repeat of the, the like one process, right? So we can see again, the light energy charges it and it comes down and then the same thing, light energy charges it. Here, right, we have this, this is the first half. So here, right, look at the left. This is supposed to be the photos, uh, photo system. And then on the left, this green thing is the photo system. And we can see, right? It's taking in the light energy and it's making the battery like charged, right? And then that's making it very like, uh, very, very charged and like powerful. And as we can see, as it moves down, it becomes less charged and then less powerful. And so on the right side here, we have the, the right side is really like right here. And what's happening is they're using, they're kind of like, you can think of it like, let's say you want to go to a fair, right? And these cell membrane here is like the gate. <clears throat> and you can think of these like H plus things. You don't need to worry about them. You can think about them about like people that really want to get in the fair, right? So this is the outside of the fair. This is the inside. And then this is the gate. So as we have our charged battery, right? Let's say with the charged battery, like on our phone, we're calling someone. And every time we make one phone call, we get one person in right? We get one person past this sort of like gate. So what's happening is we're using our phone that was charged with the energy from the light, just like how this electron is charged with energy from the light. We're using it to have more people get into the fair. So more of these H plus come in. And as we use it, right? Cause you can't just call like people keep calling them and not have your battery go down. As we're using it, the battery is like kind of draining. So just remember that, remember our analogy, because I think it'll really help you. Here, H+, just think about like happy people, right? Happy fair people. They want to get inside the fair, but we have to charge our battery first. So we charge our phone, then we make our, use our phone to make phone calls, and then every phone call, we have people coming in. And then eventually, we need to recharge it, so then that's what we're going to get into next. However, you may have noticed something very interesting. You're like, what does this mean? The P680, like that sounds very complicated. It sounds like almost like a sports car name, you know, P680. But really, uh, really it's over here. So I'm gonna talk about this and I'll go back to that slide I just passed. What it actually means is once again, don't worry, don't worry, this is just a rainbow. Just think of it as a rainbow. And think about it like plants are green, right? So the reason they're green is because they can, as you see here, around the green areas, there's actually, like, they're absorbing a lot of light. So you're thinking about, like, let's say when you go outside, maybe the, the summertime, you wear a black shirt versus wearing a white shirt. You wear, like, a white shirt, you don't feel as hot, but then you wear a black shirt because you feel, like, really hot. You're like, oh, my gosh, I'm sweating already. Because the black will actually, like, absorb a lot of that, like, light, and then, like, it'd be, like, energy. So this is the same thing that's really happening. We see the green. That's the reason plants are green because it will give them like a lot of that energy. And then that's what they need for photosynthesis from the sun. There's also a little bit of red, but then that's not as, not as like effective or not as like common really. And so going back to here, this is also another, another kind of like um, another analogy here. We have like, this is electrons we can say from maybe like the water that the, and the nutrients the plant was taking in. Then as, as time progresses, as time like goes on, it's going to like bounce down from like super high energy to like low, right? 
like when you roll a ball off the stairs, it'll go boom, 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 and then just keep going down, down, down. And so eventually, once it gets to the bottom, the ball is not going to bounce back up, right? But if you just like leave it at the very edge, it's very likely that it's going to fall off on its own. So we can say that it has like a lot of energy really at that, like at the top of the stairs there. So that was just another, another analogy. And so do, if we have any questions now, I can answer them. Or if we don't, we can keep going. All right, so we do have some questions. The first one is, how does a plant grow from a seed when it doesn't get any light? Yeah, so with the, the seed is actually very interesting because a lot of the times we study, we study like let's say plants, or I was also saying, talking about this with cells, like we studied the standard cell and it has like all these organelles and all this stuff, but the blood cells do not have all of them because they don't need them because they're very specific, right? So the same thing, the same idea can be applied here with the seed. The seed's like main job really is just to start growing. And then also another, another interesting thing we can get into later is that not all like organisms, not all like things on the earth use only sunlight. Because have you ever watched like a documentary, I don't know if you have, of like the very deep, dark ocean like bottom, right? There's still stuff living there. It's not like there's nothing there at all, but how do they live there, right? There's no light. So then how do like the, it's not really plants, but how did the, the organisms survive down there? Well, what actually happens is it's, it's very interesting because there's like these bacteria that can actually, um, they use chemicals. So different chemicals really to make their energy instead of sunlight. So like that, we can kind of think about that like the seed too, right? And then the seed also, with the seed, it's very interesting because it's trying to really put a shoot out, which is like the little stem, put it out as soon as possible so then you can have like leaves coming off of it too. So yeah, that was a really good question. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually move on here because like I said, we can answer more at the end, but I really want to get to our videos too. And really to understand photosynthesis really well, we want to take a quick like detour, I guess, to explain the light reactions, also provide some background information because a lot of the stuff we said with plants has to do with water. And <clears throat> really it's, it's pretty important with water and water plays a really big role. Also like what properties of water do we have and what properties of water are there? Yeah, so we're gonna talk all about water. Here, this is just the molecule. So the big red oxygen, these two is like hydrogen and hydrogen. That's like all you need to know. Here, we see that you can think of the oxygen maybe as like, you're really, you're really like really fun friend that just wants to hug people all the time or, you know, like high five you. So then they're gonna like bring you like closer, like maybe in a group hug or something like that, right? And so that's why the, these two are always going to be super close to the oxygen. So you can think about that. Just think about, oh, oxygen is the really like friendly guy at school, you know, and then he just wants to like, like high five everyone or be really, and everyone wants to be around him. So it's kind of like that. And we can just think about this too, is what happens is there's just, there's just like in the molecule sense with the atoms, there just becomes like a positive here and a negative over here. And what happens is just opposites attract, right? Positive goes to negative, negative goes to positive. And this really allows for all of the stuff we see in water. And we're going to show some really like cool things that you may or may have not noticed. And it's all due to this like kind of negative and positive coming together. And once again, we just see the same thing here. Yeah. So here we have a surface tension. And that's really where you see a lot of like weird things happen, right? Cause have you ever like tried to jump in the pool and then for some reason, like you belly flop or it hurts a lot, but you're like, but then like maybe you stick your hand through and you're like, why, why does that hurt so much? Water is just like, it doesn't, it's not like a rock or anything. Why did it hurt? Well, we're going to get into that. And here's a really good example. Here we see like 36 drops of water on a penny. And I just wanted to show you guys this video. And so what they're going to be doing, I'm going to turn down the volume a little bit, but what, what they're going to be doing is really, oh, I paused it. Oops. They're just, they just keep adding a drop of water, right? Each time. And then they just wait until it eventually overflows. Right. But you're wondering like already, why is the water still there? It shouldn't it just like run off of the penny. 
Well, these like kind of bond stuff, the bonds I was talking about, right? They're keeping it together. And you can think of it like, let's say you're in the, in the middle of the desert with all your friends, right? And maybe for some reason, there's just like a very small square, right? In the, like a very small tower in the, in the like middle of the desert. And on the very top of the tower, there's just a pretty small area for you guys to stand. And one by one, more friends jump on, right? But everyone wants to stay on the tower. They don't want to fall off. So you're going to keep trying to add more and more until eventually maybe someone accidentally like trips and pushes everyone and you guys all fall off. See, you can look at it. It's like, oh my, it's like crazy because you wouldn't, you wouldn't even believe that you could put that many drops of water on a penny. And that's really what hap was happening. And see, eventually it just like, it was too much and then it kind of overflowed. Yeah. So that was like a really good example because again, they're really attracted to each other. Just like I was saying in the desert, you have a tower and like more friends keep coming. No one wants to fall off the tower. So they just keep staying there and they, they keep making more room until eventually they can't fit anymore. And then you try to add one more and then everyone falls off. Yeah. So it's definitely an experiment you can do at your home. You just need a penny and just add like a, have a little dropper that drops some water on it. And it is really cool. I've done it myself. Yeah. Here we have a man trying to do a belly flop contest and I'm going to really get into why the belly flop hurts, right? Because we look down here, the water is actually like relatively smooth. And like we were saying, the water is really attracted to itself. And before it's broken, it's actually kind of solid, right? Because we look back here, we look back, it's, it looks pretty solid. It looks like there's like, I don't know, like you painted a bubble or you created like a literal like shield around the water and it's pretty solid for a while you see he keeps adding and adding and it just stays there it's not it's not like it just he adds one and everything falls apart it's pretty stable and again once again to these bonds is what's keeping it together same thing here oh yeah same thing here the bonds are keeping it like really flat and that's why if you do a belly flop like in a really still pool it's gonna hurt a lot because you like it creates Basically what it does, is it creates a, a temporary like barrier. So you can think about like when you jump up and down on the ground, you hit the ground, the ground doesn't move because it's solid. Well, for like a split second, the water will actually do that. So this is why it hurts so much because you're, you're hitting it like directly on with so much force and then that's hitting it. But then after like one second, it's over because you already broke the surface. And so once you break the surface, that's why like, as you do a belly flop, you're, you're like this, this is you, right? You're, you're perfectly like parallel. So you're right above the water and you go like this and then it hurts a lot because you're hitting it directly. However, let's say you jump in just feet first, it's not going to hurt at all because you can break it and then you won't feel anything. So that's just a really cool fun fact. So like, let's say if you have to jump off of somewhere really high, like in the movies, maybe there's a helicopter and you have to jump off in the ocean. Do not do a belly flop. You have to, you should really just dive in like a pencil almost. And then that will, that will allow you because you won't feel anything. It'll just be like, oh, I just went through the water, right? And it didn't hurt at all. Here's what I was saying. Because you see that all of a sudden there's so much force and then just tries to hit it. But then for a split second, the, the water does not break. And that's really what causes all the hurt and pain. But then eventually it does break and then everything's okay. Here I have another great video about like the properties of water and it's going to introduce some of them. So I'm going to actually go over some before we watch this video actually. So going back really to this penny, there's two things that are going on here, right? Well, actually three, we have the surface tension, which is remember it's kind of like the shield that's keeping everything together or on the pool it's keeping it like flat and almost like a, almost like the ground. Right. And it's hard for like an instant. But there's also this thing called cohesion. It's just a fancy word. I was already talking about it. I was saying the water is really attracted to each other. They want to be, they're all friends, right? They're all on that big, that big tower in the middle of the desert and they're all friends. They all want to like hold hands. They don't want to like fall off. And so they're really attracted to each other, right? <clears throat> Using the same example, we're in the desert, we're on a tower. Well, if people fall off, then like, oh no, but if you grab onto the tower, that's still good, right? Cause you're not, at least you're still on the tower. You're not on like the desert. So that brings us to another one called adhesion. So A D H E S I O N adhesion is when the water sticks to something else. 
So it doesn't stick to water anymore, but it sticks to something else. So when, let's say when the, the surface tension eventually breaks, right? And all your friends in the desert, they all fall off, but then like you manage to grab on because you're really fast or something and you're staying on there, that's actually adhesion. And here we see, yeah, here we see that there's a really big bubble kind of looking thing, right? That's the cohesion. Here it's actually attached, it looks like attached to the penny almost, and that's really the adhesion. So don't worry about these too much. The video, this video right here does a wonderful job. Like I used to watch some of these videos when I studied too, because I thought it was a really good job of like summarizing and then explaining it too. And it's a lot, a lot of fun too. So I hope you guys enjoy it. Okay, not really a riddle. We're bad at riddles, but more like clues about our favorite molecule. It's polar. It's shaped like an outstretched V. Its properties are awesome, and it makes up three-fourths of the surface of the Earth. <laughs> that one always gives it away. Our favorite molecule is water, and we're not going to lecture you about how important water is and the fact that all life as we know it could not survive without it because, yeah, that's true. But we really want to talk about what makes water so unique for biology itself. What are some awesome properties of water? Now, we mentioned the shape of water and the fact that water is polar. It has one very electronegative oxygen that is always trying to keep the electrons closer to it than to the hydrogens it's bonded to. And this actually gives oxygen a slightly negative charge because of the electrons that are spending more time next to it. And it gives the hydrogen... Yeah, so I'm going to pause it right here. This is also another way you could say, you could say, oh, there's like, let's say these are all like pencils, right, in the classroom. And then you have this really like greedy like kid who just was holding all the pencils then you could also say like, oh, well, then these two are not going to have as many pencils and they'll probably be around that kid more because they, they want to like take, take, they need pencils themselves. So that's another example of explaining it too. It's a slightly positive charge. Well, that means that other water molecules have an easy time bonding together. Why? Well, because the hydrogen of one water molecule with its slightly positive charge can bond to another water molecule's oxygen with that slightly negative charge. These bonds among the water molecules are hydrogen bonds, and these are the very bonds that allow water to have many of the properties that we're about to talk about. Have you ever looked at a really tall tree and wondered, how does the water get all the way up there? I mean, it's got to go against gravity. Gravity? Well, in our plant video, we talk about the xylem. It's vessels within certain types of plants, like trees. For the xylem, you don't need to worry about it too much. Just think of it almost as like the veins of the, the plants. Oh. Oh, wait a second. Let me, let me skip to here, I think. But what's really neat about water is that it sticks to the xylem walls in what is known as adhesion. And this helps fight gravity. But water molecules with their hydrogen bonding, they also bond to each other in something called cohesion. It's almost a beads on the string kind of fashion. Water molecules evaporate from a leaf, and then the next water molecule in line is pulled up, upwards, and so on. This cohesion is really a big deal. Cohesion is also a reason that water striders, one of our favorite insect types, can skate on water. Cohesion contributes to the surface tension of water. Water actually has quite a bit of surface tension compared to many other liquids. And it's not just water striders that can walk on water. There are a lot of insects, spiders, and even larger animals like reptiles and some birds that have the ability to walk on water. So to the Google for that. Now with water being polar, it's also a very powerful solvent for other molecules. And that means that water can dissolve many other molecules, especially polar molecules and ionic compounds. Now why does that matter? Well, this is really important because many of the processes that occur in organisms use water as a solvent. In our body system video, we talk about the function of kidneys, and you definitely couldn't have kidneys doing their function without water. 
also a main component for body fluids is water. I'll never forget when I was little, my father built us a pond. Okay, before we get into here, I also wanted to say like, think about when you eat food, right? How is that getting broken down? Well, there's, there's stomach acid, right? But then there's also, what is that stomach acid made of? It's partly water. And really just the stomach acid being very strong and the water being able to really break it down, like she was saying, is really what helps you break down your food. Because you eat like, let's say you go to all you can eat buffet, how is it gonna be able to break down and eventually be nutrients too? And we're actually gonna talk about that, the process for us in like my next seminar too. So make sure you guys watch that. We had some goldfish in there and I loved this pond. Well, in West Texas, where we're from, it can freeze in the winter. And one morning I went outside, terrified to find that the top of the pond had frozen. And I thought our fish were goners. Only to find out that they were swimming and doing their fish activities under the ice layer. It's common for many substances to actually contract when they freeze. And yeah, and then so like what she's saying, right? Because let's say you go to North Pole and then you might be standing on ice, but there might not actually be land underneath it. And you've always seen ice always floats. Well, that's because when you think about the three, like the three phases, right? We have liquid and then we have solid and we have, then we have like um, the gas, so the vapor. So let's use water, right? Well, we all know liquid water. You drink the water that's in our bodies. And then we also know the solid, that's ice. And we know that ice is less dense. That just means it can float in the like water. So ice can float in water. Okay, that's good. And the next one is gas. So if you've ever tried boiling water and you notice st steam starts to come up, that's something called water vapor. It's just a fancy name for like water that's in the gas form. And that's also why like you might be thinking, oh, well, there's clouds outside, but how does it rain, right? It's because originally you had that water vapor that eventually it turned into clouds and then uh, released the water again as liquid. And that's like the water cycle and to become more dense. But water expands when it freezes and becomes less dense in its frozen state, resulting in floating ice, where it can actually make this insulated surface layer that makes a difference for many organisms underneath. And this is due to the hydrogen bonds. See, at freezing level, the making and breaking of hydrogen bonds, which usually happens pretty often, it's not happening very much when frozen. And so the molecules, they're set into this lattice of hydrogen bonded molecules, just far enough apart that it's less dense in ice form than it is in water form. And that's going to be very important for all of that aquatic life. Speaking of temperature, water resists changing its temperature. It has what's called a high specific heat. Specific heat, it's a measurement of heat that's needed to be absorbed or lost for one gram of a substance to change its temperature by one degree. Yeah, so what she's saying here, she's using a lot of like specific terminology, right? But really what she's saying, if you ever notice, you're like, well, when I go to the ocean, it's cooler like than, than it is in the desert, right? But what actually happens is like water can actually store heat. It's kind of interesting. Because let's say you have a pool, and then during the day, that pool is absorbing energy from the sun, because we already said the, the plants are using that energy from the sun, and that's getting absorbed by the pool, right? Because it's not just going nowhere, it's getting absorbed. Then at nighttime, the heat, since there's no more heat, it just slowly just like releases, and then that's why in, you, you think about the desert, right? At daytime, it's super hot. At nighttime, it's like freezing cold. Because there's, the reason is because there's no like lakes or like oceans there that will control it. So being next to a lake will actually be more stable like temperature. So that means it'll probably be cooler, but it also won't get that hot during the day. But you look at deserts, which don't have any water really, they get super hot during the day and they get super cold at night. And there's no like in between for them. That's why when you go to the ocean, it's usually just relatively cool all the time. So that's really like a fun fact. And that's why if you live next to a beach or something, it's going to be cooler than you live like in the desert in the middle of nowhere. Celsius. And that's why on the first day that school is out in the summer, it may be super hot outside, but the water could still be pretty cool. 
It's really good that water's like this for life. It's stabilizing for aquatic environment temperatures. And it also means that water can absorb a lot of heat in the summer without reaching as high of a temperature itself, which is useful when winter comes along because then the water can release heat as it cools in the winter. This also impacts the environment. Now, still on the topic of temperature, consider evaporation. So we all know like evaporation, right? And really evaporation is just what we were saying, right? Because we we're boiling a pot of water. Then what's happening is from that water, we're having all this vapor that's coming out. And really that vapor is just coming out, right? And it's turning into the clouds. But think about this really cool fact. When you sweat, why is your body sweating? Like you, you're, technically it wouldn't be a waste of water, right? Because you need that water. Why is your body sweating? Well, to cool you down, right? But how is it cooling you down? Why is just having water on your body cooling you down? What's actually happening is evaporation. Because she was talking about how much energy you need to make water like really, really change temperature, right? You boil a pot of water, it takes a while. Like it takes a while. You turn up high heat, it still takes a while to boil that water. Same thing, during the day, you go to the pool. It's really sunny outside. The water might still be cold. That's because it takes a lot of energy to really change the temperature. So what's happening when you sweat is your body's really hot. So then it releases water. The water takes a lot of the energy or heat away from you by evaporating. So you can think of it like your, your body is putting off the water and then the water is like, oh, well, okay, I'll just take this, this heat with me. So by doing it and by doing it all over your body, you're cooling yourself down. And that's why like after you sweat, you always feel like super cooled down. So we have a riddle for you. Okay, not really. Consider evaporation. Many animals rely on evaporation to cool them. Think of water molecules. They are moving, but those that have more heat energy, they're moving the fastest. And they're the more likely molecules to make the phase change to gas. And these molecules, as they leave, their energy, their heat, is no longer on your skin. And by the way, all of this is not just animals, too. Plants use evaporative cooling to aid them in hot temperatures. Excessive high temperatures could be very dangerous for many different processes in both plants and animals. It can be damaging to the enzymes involved in those processes. So that evaporative cooling is very important. Well, we went through a lot of features of water. Yeah, and then just at that last part, she was saying, like, again, she was talking about the evaporative cooling, but also that, because we think about, like, why, how does something change from water to solid, or maybe, like, solid to, like, liquid to gas, right? And we think about it, like, about the atoms, right? Well, solid, nothing's moving, because you can't, it's very hard, like, you pick up ice cube, it's hard, but then once it starts melting in your hand, the water is like is liquid, right? Because it's just moving all over your hand. It's not like rigid anymore. So what's happening is, like she was saying, you can think of ice like as a good example, right? Because in a solid, the, the bonds are locked. It's like locked. And it's like just firm. It's like rigid, stuck, locked. But then after it melts, then they start to move just a little bit, right? And we're talking about the water molecules, so the H2O, the one right here they just start to move a little bit. And then eventually with the gas, they start moving all over the place and then they just it really like just go all over the place, which is why when you have water, it can eventually, if you keep, uh, keep boiling it, eventually you'll have nothing in the pot because all the liquid water turned into gas. Yeah, so we talked about co cohesion already. And here is just like two little water molecule buddies. And this is also why like you see this, right? So in this case, there's not much adhesion, which is like keeping it to the surface. And like, which um, means the water molecules don't really want to like be, uh, be near the surface. So they're kind of balling up together like that. And then adhesion, like we we're saying, oh, this is a very interesting thing. If you guys ever do labs or something at school, maybe you have to measure some water you pour it into this thing called the graduated cylinder over here on the left. And then this graduated cylinder just measures how much water there is. But you'll see that why is it not flat? You might be like, well, the bottom's maybe not flat. Well, the bottom's actually flat. What's happening here is the adhesion 
is what's happening. The water becomes more attracted. So the water wants to climb up the sides more than it wants to be with itself. It wants to be like up on the sides here and then climb up a little bit, which is why you kind of get this curved shape. Over here, this is a really cool experiment, right? You have, let's just say this is water. And then what this really is here is just tubes, but like different size tubes. And then this is all flat, right? But then this tube is bigger and then smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Think about it. When there's less water, more of it is going to be attracted to this glass, right? Because we said already that water wants to be attracted to like the plastic or the glass more than it wants to be attracted to itself, which is why we had the meniscus. This is what it's called. It's just a fancy name for the little round thing. And this is what, what we have here, right? This is why we have it. Well, if you take a really, really thin like glass tube, and then you have a level, like let's say you have a pot of water and you just put the tube there, what will actually happen is the water will start to defy gravity and it'll just move up because it's so attracted to the glass. It's really quite crazy because you, you might be thinking like, that's not even possible. Like, you know, Newton said like gravity, like everything falls down. And then so, but this is really, is so interesting because it actually defies it. And yeah, I thought it was really cool personally. Here. We have a really, really cool video. This guy is actually, this was recorded on the ISS, which is the International Space Station. And he's talking about how the properties of water are actually different from what, from like what it is on Earth, right? Because you think in space, there's actually no gravity. So how does that change things? Well, let's find out. And I'm actually gonna, yeah. Welcome to NASA Launchpad. I'm your host, Audrey Staple. You might have heard the saying that opposites attract. And you know, that's true in a lot of cases, like in some bad romantic comedy. Or when you bring a pair of magnets close to each other, north and south poles will snap together. But sometimes, like with water, molecules of the same substance attract. Wonder why? You'll get a better picture of why when you get the chance to see water someplace other than Earth like on the International Space Station, commonly referred to as the ISS, where water appears to be nearly weightless. Here's Canadian Space Agency astronaut Bob Thirsk on the ISS with a closer look at water and the special property. The intermolecular forces cause water to be attracted to itself, which is called cohesion. For example, here are two spheres of water. When the spheres are several centimeters apart, there's no attractive forces between them. But when I bring them close enough together to, attra to attract, they merge through their attractive forces. So, you probably already know that water molecules are attracted to other water molecules. And that's called cohesion. Well, these same cohesive forces are responsible for surface tension. Surface tension is the property of a liquid that makes it beat up when it drifts on the surface like a leaf or your skin or a coin. Water surface tension is pretty strong. You can check it out with an eyedropper of water and a penny. Take a closer look. See what happens when you squeeze the water out onto the penny, one drop at a time. How many drops do you think you can gently squeeze onto the penny before the water spills over the side of the penny? I bet it'll be more than you expected. Surface tension is what allows the water drops to cling together forming that dome or bulge at the top. You can see that water surface tension is pretty strong. You can also see the cohesion of the water as it stuck to itself. But the water did something else as well. It stuck to the penny too. Why was that? Here's Bob again to explain and to show how it works in space. Intermolecular forces can also cause water to be attracted to other materials. This is called adhesion. For example, water can stick to a straw. When I move the straw close to the sphere, the water sticks.
Water sticks to many other materials as well. Think about all the things on Earth that you see little water drops on. Windows, tree leaves, even your own skin. Let me show you with my hand, the molecules in my skin will pull hard enough to make the water stick. The water tries to find a balance between the cohesion with the water and the adhesion to my hand. Eventually it settles on an unusual shape that fills the space between my fingers. If I continue by adding water, I can eventually build an entire glove of water that will stay fixed to my hand. It sticks to my hand by intermolecular forces. How cool is that? You know, if it weren't for gravity, subtle forces like surface tension, cohesion, and adhesion might have a lot bigger impact on our everyday lives on Earth. Would we still use bowls, spoons, and cups? Or would we come up with new tools that would make our lives easier? Well, that's something to think about as we plan to explore places like the moon, Mars, and beyond. That's it for now. I'm Audrey. Yeah, so then, like, I thought that was really interesting because, like, you always think, oh, we're on Earth, right? It's always, like, water's the same. We drink out of a cup. But when you think about it, like, what if it wasn't like that? What if everything was weightless? Like, how much harder would that be? You try to eat your bowl of cereal in the morning and the milk and the, everything's just floating. And I thought it was really cool how he showed that without gravity, if you don't have gravity, like, you could just, like, stick it to your hand, stick the water and just, like, it just be on your hand and kind of, because it's, it's like attracted to your hand and then there's no gravity pulling it down anymore. So, yeah. And then do we have any questions? Uh, yes, we certainly do have questions. So our next question is actually pretty interesting. So you've shown on a previous slide of a water molecule and the person asked, why must the molecules be in the shape of a Mickey Mouse? Electronegativity? Yeah, so what what's really just happening is like you that's okay so here's the thing like with with the drawings we always have to remember that they're not they're not always completely accurate because a lot of the times to help us understand stuff sometimes like scientists simplify things and so really like we could get into like the the structure of the atom and like get really into detail about that but they wanted to give us just the main idea like here's a hydrogen atom and then here's a hydrogen atom and here's the oxygen but like we're seeing in the, the video we watched, the, the one we just watched before this one, I think, and then like there's actually electrons that are like moving and then there's a lot of kind of complex stuff that's going on to really make that. So they, they just like to simplify it too because um, really, really the way if they were to put the two at like the end, like it would, basically you could like form a line, which they've done like observations on like water and they found that it's not really how it works, you know, like you don't just form a line. You can't, you can't form one where it's just like literally one water molecule like next to each other. So then they kind of assume that it's different. And once again, with the positive, negative charges, it just kind of gets more complex too. All yeah. right. And then we can take another question. All right. So our next question is, does the type of liquid have an effect on how much you can add to the penny? Yes, yes. So... Actually, there's a really cool, um, really cool thing, right? Because we're looking at the graduated cylinder with the water. And let me actually go back to it. Uh, let me go back to graduated cylinder, right? We have this, this like meniscus thing that kind of curved. Well, if you pour mercury, which is very dangerous and toxic, they do it like in a very special lab, right? But if you pour mercury, mercury it's, a, it's like, it's a, it's a type of um, like liquid too, right? And it's very like dangerous so do not do that at home and yeah for sure don't do it but what will happen is actually it won't form this downwards it'll form an upwards one so it looks so different it's weird it's like mercury already already looks like liquid metal even though it's not it just looks like that but then so imagine having a graduated cylinder and then at the very top it just makes a little dome so that's really something else it really depends on the liquid which is why we don't have like we don't have like soda as our like water in our body. We don't have orange juice. We don't have milk. We have just like water, right? And really just what, what, the, what is in like the water. So most things are like a, a mixture of water and something else, right? But then like other liquid substances, like we don't have, um, 
liquid, like real liquid metal. We don't have that in our bodies. And it's just, again, due to the properties. Also think about it. You have like a, let's say a gold bar to make that gold bar liquid gold. It takes a lot of heat. So then in our bodies, they're not that insane heat. Like we don't have a furnace. We're not just like a furnace that can melt anything. So we also have to think about like realistically how it's going to work because our bodies are usually just like one temperature and they're not going to change and they can't get too hot, right? Because then stuff's going to start to break down. So that's like kind of the balance that our bodies are, always have and which is why that water fits that balance really perfectly. Yeah, that was an amazing question. So we're going to move on here because I still want to get through, we still have some more stuff and I want to make sure we get through it too. Here's one more experiment we can do. It's a really cool experiment, super easy at your house. So what you do here is you have a couple cups, it doesn't matter as many, and you, this is a paper towel. And then what happens is you just fold the paper towel over like in this picture and you have empty cups here. What you fill up is you fill up like water here, water here, water here, and you add different food coloring. And what will happen is you add different food coloring, right? And these cups are empty. What will actually happen is the red will go all the way up the paper towel and go down into here. And then the same thing here, this, this like kind of uh, greenish will go up the paper towel and then kind of like down and then it'll keep going. And you get this really beautiful like rainbow color when some of these cups were not even full at, at the very beginning. And just shows how the water can kind of climb up with the like adhesion to the paper towel, right? It's, it's getting attracted to something else and it'll actually go over. And so I think it's very easy. And if you guys want to do it at your house, it's, it's very cool to kind of watch. Also talking about the plants, right? Cause that's what they were talking about in this video is like how plants, they have the kind of chain. You can think of it like a real chain, right? When you pull on the chain, more of the little like links, more of these come together. So that's just like water. You pull on the chain, more water molecules come up. So when we have, you can think of the stomata as kind of like the skin, right? Of the tree and, or like that's how it breathes. And so when it like exhales, basically, kind of what happens is it also releases some air. Like, so when we breathe, maybe you breathe on a window after like just, or on a window or on your mirror, you'll see that your breath actually has a little bit of water in it. That's called like water vapor, right? That's just in us. And that's also in the plants. So when they release that, it's pulling that chain that's pulling the water up through it. Cause otherwise like how else is the water going to go from down there all the way up the tree? And it also helps with the connection with the water to the side of the inside of the tree. And then that will help it kind of move up. Here, same thing. So Mata, this is the water leaving. And then this is the end of our water detour. So we're gonna get back to the photosynthesis here. I'm gonna skip this cause we're kind of running short on time and I'm gonna keep going. Here, this was what we saw, right? This one is the, I believe this was like the first one here. This is the just uh, review photo system here. That's the one where we kind of take, take our, our phone and we charge it, right? And then as we call more people to come into the fair, then it slowly goes down. And now we're gonna focus more on like this going down part. So here we can just see that like this kind of energy and charging is being passed along. And so yeah, we're not gonna get into too much, but what you can think of is we go back here, right? Uh, yeah, so let's say, let's say like this is the outside of the fair and then this is the inside of the fair, right? Well, as we call people, then the like, um, then the power is gonna go down and more people are gonna go in. But after the fair closes, we have this one entrance, right? And then all the people come out. And you think of a fair like where, you know how they have little spinny things when like they count how many people that come out? Well, imagine if you attach like a motor to that. Well, you could make some energy, right? Because people have to push it to get out and there'd be a lot of people. So that's what we're doing here. We're making energy from that. And so that's what's happening in plants really. And also here's, here's more in depth on the like photo system, right? This we can think of also as like a solar panel. And then on the solar panel, it looks like this. And then it gets all the sun energy. And in the very center, it's very like concentrated. So then it really like charges up. So just like how we have the energy already in our outlet and we plug in our phone, just like how it comes in from the sun and then it, it focuses on the one point and then charges up and then we can use that energy. Here's another analogy. 
if you guys ever been to an airport, right? You put your baggage or you're trying to pick it up so you guys can leave. And then it comes out here. Then you like pass it maybe to someone else. And then the electrons are really just, they're just moving. And that's like the energy really moving. And here, here is our like little, we can think of it as our gate, our counting gate. And we're using this to make energy, right? We're saying that the, the little exit has a spin thing that only one person can go in at a time. And what's happening is it's generating energy. It's like turning the wheel and that's making the motors, that's making energy. Yeah, so that was, that was the end. And uh, thank you everyone for coming. I really enjoyed it. I hope you guys enjoyed it too. I hope you guys like the videos. So if we have any questions, I can definitely go over them now. Yep. So we actually have a few questions, but if I don't happen to read yours in the next few minutes, feel free to just drop them in the chat. Right. So our first question is, if chloroplasts are green and plants need those to make food, how do plants that are purple or white, like the silver foliage, make food? Yeah. So, okay. Here's, here's definitely one interesting thing too, right? Because some plants like they have to be careful actually because it's not like you just have like your 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 green leaves and you just open them up all the time what can actually happen is if the sun is too strong think about in the desert right a lot of like the plants are different if the sun is too strong and it hits the leaf it's going to end up killing it right so that's where if you have like a sun that's in direct uh sorry a tree that's in direct sunlight what's going to end up happening is it can start to wither even if you're getting enough water it's just not really made for that kind of sunlight. So that's why the leaves will actually change color as let's say there's less energy needed. That's why when you go to somewhere where the, the leaves fall off, and so as the leaves are getting ready to fall off, they don't, they already have enough energy. So that's why they're kind of changing that color and then eventually just falling off. And then the tree is like hibernating. And yeah, so that's what's happened. All right, thank you so much. And a related question is then how do cactuses work? They don't get a lot of water. Yeah, so the cactuses, I was gonna include this, but we already had like a lot of slides and I wanna make sure I get to the video. So the cactuses, they actually use a slightly different process, right? Because think about it, the stomata is like the skin, they release water. But think about when it's really dry out, then if they release water, they're losing water, they're losing precious water, right? We said like, well, why would you want to release water if it's super dry out and you're just, that's just wasting water, right? Well, what, what they do actually is they, they do a lot of this stuff at night. So let's say they take in, cause they need to take in like that carbon dioxide, right? Taking that water. Well, they can keep the water for a while, but then they just won't open the stomatas. The stomatas like the, the pores, right? The skin, they just won't open it. And then, but the problem is, not only does water go through that little like gate, but also so does carbon dioxide, which they use. So what they do, a very ingenious move, at nighttime when it's super cool, they take in a bunch of carbon dioxide. Then they either keep it and like they make it into some sort of like acid where it can like, like be stored sort of. And then during the day, they're just using that and then they're kind of taking, um, taking the... Yeah, taking the water too, and they're using the sunlight, and they're making the the sugars, and then they have they keep all the oxygen inside as well, and then at nighttime they also release that oxygen. So that's really it again, like because we we look at these very straightforward, very easy to understand like processes, but it doesn't always apply to every single type of plant. Like the, someone brought up earlier, not all plants are green. There's really a lot of differences. And it's, again, because there's different specialized areas and how the, how the plant ends up adapting is a lot different. Because we, if we have a cactus that's in a very dry condition versus something in a tropical rainforest, those two plants are going to be vastly different. They're going to be really different. And it's, again, how the environment is going to shape that plant. All right, thank you so much for that explanation. And this other question is, how come when I drink water, it doesn't come up like, like it does in a tree? Yeah, so like it's a, lot, it's a lot different because the trees, to some degree, they, they don't have like as complex like organs as us, right? And they don't have, because like on the inside, they have those like kind of veins, but those are really just passageways for water. So the, the trees really work a lot differently. Also. For us, like the, 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 yeah, just the way our body works is a lot different. And 
the gravity in our case is really just working because let's think about it. Our throat is actually pretty big. If you actually searched up those like xylem that they were talking about, they're really like small veins and like, or veins, right? Cause they're not really veins, they're just wood, but they're very small. And remember what we we're talking about, right? With the other example where you have that really small glass tube, the water will actually go against gravity. But in our case, our throats are very huge. Like compared to our, compared to the trees, our stomachs are really big. They hold a lot and then they need to have like a huge passageway for food to go down. So that's not really the, how it's going to work and how water is going to be able to travel up because it needs to be able to like kind of go through a very tiny little gap thing and then be able to go and then uh, kind of climb, if you will, on the side of something. But really when it's too big, the water is not all going to go like that. So it has to be very small with a lot of like surface area, you could say, just a lot of area where the adhesion can happen, where the water molecule can attach to something else. Because on our body, right, in our throat, like I was saying, we have like, let's say it's this big, right? There's not that much compared to how much like water there is, right? But then if we have a very tiny one. It's very easy because there's a lot compared to how much water will go in. There's a lot of area and then that will really help it just go up. So that's like a major difference between us and trees. And that was a really great question because I'm sure a lot of you were wondering like, well, they can divide gravity. Why can't our like, why doesn't our like um, organs and all stuff do that too? All right, thank you so much. That was a really simple organ uh, explanation and that just makes it really clear. All right, so I think this is gonna be the last question, but it's how do you breathe in the Arctic where, where there are no plants? Yeah, so uh, like let's go back to the very first video we watched, how he was saying these are the lungs of the earth. Well, thankfully for us, there's not like the Arctic just doesn't have like it's all sectioned off and then the deserts are not all sectioned off because to some degree, there is still going to be oxygen released, right? Because it is harsh environment. It is hard. There is going to be some oxygen released. But again, it's not going to be as much as like a tropical rainforest and there's not going to be as much carbon dioxide being taken in. So that's a really good point. But we're thankful that our atmosphere is like all connected. So let's say like we have, we have like, and I'm looking at a map here on my side, but we have like Brazil, right? Very big, very like tropical area that's going to produce a lot of oxygen and taking a lot of carbon dioxide. That's going to make up for a lot of the deserts and then the Arctic and then, you know, a lot of the places where there's not that much, not that many plants and not that much is happening. That's why when we cut down a lot of our forests, it's having a really big impact on our entire like just climate and everything and really the amount of oxygen that's going to be in our atmosphere is really dependent on trees which is why they're so important all right so i think that's it for today thank you so much ryan for this really interesting seminar it was pretty fun to learn about all the different things of photosynthesis and how you just made it really easy to understand